what exactly does it mean to follow Christ? You say, I want to follow Christ in 2020. In Matthew 4, 19, the Bible says, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. If we're going to follow Christ, if, you're, if you are going to say, I'm following Christ in 2020, number one goal, man, 2020 has in store for you some fishing for men. There's going to be opportunities that you're going to intentionally take to reach other people, uh, to share the gospel, to tell someone about Christ, and to, to bring them to Him. That's what 2020 includes if you're following Christ. In Matthew 16, verse 24, Then said Jesus unto His disciples, If any man will come after Me, means that you're going to follow Me, He says, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Uh, Do you know if if 2020 is going to be a year where we follow Christ, it means it's going to be a year where you deny yourself, where you say, it is not about me this year. It's not about my goals. It's not about what I want. It's about what he wants. The Bible says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Sometimes we chase our own direction, our own desires, and we need to chase Christ and what He wants. In John chapter 8, verse 31, another passage about following Christ, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, He said, If ye continue in My word, then are ye My disciples indeed. If you want to be a true disciple, a learner, a follower of Christ, there's there's a, a quality, a trait that should be there, and that is continuing in Christ's words and what He taught us and what He said to us and what He left for us, continuing in, in His word. In verse 32, He says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, what is the truth? John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's another passage of Scripture that tells us that God's Word is truth. In Matthew 28, Jesus said to His disciples, you can look in verse 16, Matthew 28, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain, where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. I want to help us refocus a little bit here going into the new year. If we're going to follow Christ, it's going to mean we're going to fish for men. We're going to deny ourselves. We're going to be continuing in His Word. We're going to be about what He left uh, these disciples. He said, go and teach all nations. Go make disciples of every single nation that's out there. Uh, We're going to be involved in seeing people baptized, and then we're going to help people to continue to do all the things that Jesus commanded. Somebody tell me, what was it that Jesus commanded? What's that? Love Love your neighbor. That's right. If you look in Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 36, so the man said to Jesus, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, this is a commandment here, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That's challenging. That's, That's a challenge to all of us to start the year off with that as the great commandment. Verse 38, this is the first and great commandment. That's the number one. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Another passage says all your might, all your effort that you have. And then just as Tim said, the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus had two great commands to explain. He said, one, love God, but two, love others. And it was those commands where Jesus said, I want you to go, I want you to teach all nations. You're supposed to tell everybody about Christ, that He died on the cross, that He's the Savior, that He rose from the dead. 
Uh, but after they've received him and after they've been baptized, we're supposed to teach them to do what Jesus commanded us, to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to teach them to love their neighbor as their self, to love one another. Jesus values this love for each other. Do you know that? Relationships are important to Jesus. In John 13, he says, A new commandment I give unto you. John 13, 34. A new commandment. He says, That ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. There's a command, one that we're supposed to spread, one that we're supposed to follow, that is the command to love one another. It's a very important command to Christ. And I think it's one that we many times forget. It's one that we miss. If we're supposed to be teaching others to observe whatsoever He commanded us, He commanded us this thing uh, to love one another as He loved us. Do we do it? Jesus values relationships greatly. He meant for us to treasure them and to have healthy relationships. See, Jesus, we, we just kind of worked our way up into these letters from the Apostle Paul and others. And uh, Jesus, He commissioned the apostles with this task to go and make disciples and to teach these things. And so now we come today and we have this Bible complete with Jesus' words and letters of His apostles that we follow that teach us how to do what we're supposed to do. I want to come uh, to a specific passage in Colossians chapter 3. That's where we're going to land tonight and get our message, but I, I wanted to bring you up to there. In Colossians chapter 3, this is a passage that will help you refocus, okay? I only have a short amount of time to explain and share this with you tonight. It would be worth your while to read this a few times this week. Uh, Colossians. But in Colossians chapter 3, uh, we, we refocus starting in verse number 1. The Apostle Paul says to this church, If ye then be risen with Christ... If ye then be risen with Christ, it's interesting. It's like, church, are you not Christians? Yes, we are Christians. Well, Christians are a certain way. Christians behave a certain way. Christians live a certain way because that's who we are. We are following Christ. Everything that we just said, we follow Christ, which means we continue in His Word, which means we live a certain way. And he says, if ye then be risen with Christ, which they were, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. He says a couple words here. He says, seek those things which are above. He says, listen, you are saved. You are a Christian and Christ is in heaven. He ascended, right? The Holy Spirit is down here doing the work, living inside of us, giving us power and strength. But, the, but Jesus is up in heaven. The Bible says, if you're following him, why don't you care about the things he cares about? Why don't you concern yourself with the things he is concerned with? Many times we get our sights just set on so many things that are down here on this earth. He says to set your affection. Uh, did anybody get a smart thermostat for Christmas? Anybody? Who has a smart thermostat? I love technology. It's like that Napoleon Dynamite movie, right? Uh, listen, uh, you get the thermostat. Okay, you have, all of you have a thermostat, hopefully. You turn it. Do you know why you turn it up? Because your house is cold. And you want to set that thing because you want it to be 68 or 70. Some of you say 70 is too much. You're going to run your bill up, young man. Uh, listen, 75, no, we, we, we don't need that. Uh, 75 is too hot. Um, my wife and I, we're always setting the temperature different ways. I turn it up and she turns it down and vice versa. But the idea here is that you set, you are the one that makes a choice where your affections are. Christians, we are risen with Christ and we are to set, we're to choose where we're looking, to choose what we're focused on, on things above, not on things on the earth. Why would he say this to a church, to set your affections on things above? Why would he say this to a church, to seek those things which are above? It's because we drift. It's because our attention goes a different way. 
There's that song that says, we're prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. We're prone to wander. We're prone to care about things that don't matter to God. We're, we're prone to take our eyes and set them on careers and jobs and stuff that we own and things that we want and all that. But he says, if you're risen with Christ, set your affection on things above. Now, what are those things that Christ cares about? We've already learned we ought to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're to love our neighbor as ourself. Well, there's this passage that, that comes into Colossians chapter 3 that is so helpful. He begins in verses 1 through 9, and he names some things that we should mortify to put to death that denying of self. And I'm not going to cover that passage, but he names some sins. He says, take this out of your life. It shouldn't be there. You ought to read the, through those. But he gets into verse number 10, and he gets into some things that remind us about our relationships, that second command to love your neighbor as Christ has loved you. That's, that's a high bar. And I want to show you five words in this passage that we can remember uh, tonight. Let's, let's read the passage here, uh, starting in verse number 10. The Bible says, And have put on, this is Colossians 3, verse 10, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Jesus wants us to love one another as He loved us. And there's five words that you should remember going into 2020. Five words. Let's walk through them here. Uh, in verse number 12, He says, Put on, therefore... Uh, you know, take off these things he said earlier, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, he says, bowels of mercies, kindness. The first word to remember is the word compassion. That's what that means, this bowels of mercies. We don't use that language. When you hear bowels, kids start <laughs> laughing and telling jokes. And uh, you, you know, so do adults. That's right. We're just big kids. Uh, bowels of mercies, what? Uh, it, it means compassion that is heartfelt. It means personal care. He uses the word kindness to describe that further, and that simply means goodwill toward others. What that means, that word compassion, that means that I care about the well-being of those around me. Listen, if we're to love one another as Christ also loved us, we're to put on this behavior, this compassion, this attitude toward others, that we should look out for one another. That when you look at those around you, whether they're ones that you like or dislike, or ones that you know or don't know, ones that are like you or not like you, no matter who it is, we ought to show compassion. There ought to be a uh, care for the well-being of the people around us. It's the word compassion. Also in verse number 12, he continues and he uses the phrase humbleness of mind. The second word is humility. If we're to love others as Christ loved us, we need to remember the word humility. Humility is having a proper perspective of yourself. Uh, it's lowliness of mind. Uh, many think that this means that you should think low of yourself, lowliness of mind, but that's not the case. It's not self-deprecating where you say, I'm terrible, I'm no good. We all know we're sinners, but this is a proper perspective of yourself. It's you saying, I am no better than others. Many times as we grow in our Christian life, if, if we don't participate in certain sins, we can look at others that do and say, I'm better than them. 
or, and we wouldn't say it out loud, but we, we do think that way. I'm not going to associate with them because nah, I, don't, I don't hang with those people or those aren't my kind of people. The Bible says if we're to love others as Christ loved us, we need to have humbleness of mind, uh, a thought that I am no better than others. If for the grace of God, I would be that way too. We need to ha- be humble. The word humility is a word to remember. Uh, the next word I want to show you here is in verse 13. The Bible says, forbearing one another. Forbearing. Did anybody use this word in a sentence this week? No, you didn't. This is such an important word. Such an important word. Have you ever got annoyed with somebody? How many of you got annoyed with somebody today? Uh, listen, there are people that do things that are just annoying Amen. all the time. Uh, some people, you just don't want to be around them. Uh, the word forbearing one another is so important. This is huge in the teen group. This is huge in the older group. For every person in here, we have to learn to forbear. This is one of those mature Christian things we learn to do, okay? None of us knows how to do this naturally. Uh, all of us are bothered by the things other people say. We don't like how they said it. We don't like what they wear. We don't like what they look like. We don't like that they're doing that thing that we don't like that they're doing. Forbearing means this. Forbearing is a word that means uh, to put up with. It means to suffer and endure. Here's what forbearing one another says. It says, I will overlook your faults. I will overlook your faults. It's a choose. That, a, a choose. It's a choose. Oh, man. First sermon of the year. Here we go. It's a choice that you need to make. To say, even though you do this thing that bothers me, or even though you said this thing in a way that I didn't like, I'm going to choose to overlook it. Uh, So many times we have this ability, and we live in a generation now, it's absolutely insane, and some of you have hopped on the train that you get offended by everything. Nobody can do anything unless you're offended. You're just offended, and many of you make, I'm not saying you, but many people uh, make it known on Facebook that this bothers me, and that bothers me, and that bothers me. Uh... Uh, there's actually a verse that says, and it's coming to me now, you know, uh, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Uh, that's a good verse someone shared with me one time. Uh, but we, we get offended at people because we don't like the way they do things, whatever it is. People say things to you in a funny way and they, uh, there's all kinds of things we could complain about in 2020. Uh, it, it could be somebody in your family that you just don't like how they do this thing or they uh, you know, husbands and wives. They, he always leaves the laundry on the floor. They don't put the dishes away. They don't do this. They don't do that. Um, there are little things. Forbearance is needed in the church. Forbearance is needed in our homes. It's needed among our friends. When somebody does something that you don't like, you need to learn to forbear. Forbearing says, even though I could say something to you right now and tell you why I don't like that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overlook that. Even though I could choose never to talk to you again, I'm going to overlook that. Even though, uh, you know, next time I could avoid you, I'm going to overlook one of your faults because I'm forbearing. The Bible says forbearing one another. It goes both ways. Each one of us are supposed to forbear one another. You may think that you are normal and you have no quirks and you are not annoying. But the truth is you annoy someone else just as much as someone else annoys you. Okay? Don't forget that. Somebody is forbearing you, and you should forbear them as well. The next word to remember in 2020 is the word forgiveness. The word forgiveness. He says in verse 13, forbearing one another, uh, but he takes it further. The Bible says, and forgiving one another. The Bible says, If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. This is really important. The Bible says we're to love one another. Great commandment, as Christ loved us. This passage takes it a little further and explains. He says if there's any problems among you, if there's any issues that you have with someone else in the church, someone in your family, someone that uh, is your friend, the Bible says, if there's a quarrel, an uh, argument, a discussion against any, you know what you're supposed to do? Forgive. Forgiveness. As Christ forgave you, so also 
do ye. Forgiveness says this. If, if forbearance says, I'm going to overlook your faults, forbearance, or, or for, forgiveness says, I will no longer hold on to your sins against me. People wrong us. People do things that hurt us. We ought to forgive. Why should we forgive? You have been forgiven. You have been forgiven. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 18, uh, there's, there, here's, a, here's a, if I'm giving you five words, this would be word number six, but I, I haven't got the number five yet, so we'll call this word 4B, okay? Uh, in Matthew 18, verse 15, the Bible says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, somebody does you wrong, okay, or you uh, felt wrong, go, that's your 4B word, go, go, and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Um, we don't naturally resort to addressing issues between people. Uh, we should. It's a supernatural thing. If, if there's uh, somebody in your group of friends or somebody in your church, then you have a quarrel against them. The Bible says you're supposed to forgive them. Uh, but the Bible says if somebody trespasses against you, it's your responsibility to go. Go. In 2020, it's not okay to gossip. It's okay to go and make things right. It's so important. It's not okay to complain and put vague things out on Facebook. Somebody says something to me and I'm just not feeling it today. Or whatever people post these vague things, and you know what I'm talking about. And they post them and as if somebody did them wrong, but they're not going to name them. That's not okay for Christians to do. It's not becoming of a Christian to do that sort of thing. We go to each other. Because we follow the Bible, right? I say, I'm going to follow Christ in 2020. Well, if, if you're going to be my disciple indeed, Christ said, you're going to continue in my word. And his word says, if you have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. He said in Matthew 18, 15, if your brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. You say, but my brother keeps trespassing against me. They did it once and I, I forgave him and they did it again. Well, if you read further in Matthew 18, and I won't get into this passage, the Bible says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till 70 times? What was Jesus' answer? 70 times 7. What is that? Somebody do that math. 490. Thank you. You're just a calculator. That's great. 490 it means you just forgive. Because you know what? There's not a time where you go to God and you ask for forgiveness and He says no. He doesn't do that. You go to God and He forgives and He forgives and He forgives and He forgives and He forgives. This has got to be a year of forgiveness. Uh, this, is, this should not be a year for you where you're holding on to a grudge that was in 2019. You've got to forgive and you've got to go to that person and address it. That's what the Bible says and that's what Christians that are following Christ in 2020 will do. Word number five uh, in the passage back in Colossians chapter three. The fifth word to remember is the word love. Verse number 14. And above all these things, above the forbearance, above the forgiveness, above all those other things, there's this word called love. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. This is the one that binds the rest together. If you go over to 1 Corinthians 13, you should do that on your own time. 1 Corinthians 13 is going to describe to you how you ought to love one another as Christ also loved you. Remember, it always it thinks no evil. So many times we, we jump to conclusions about people and we say they're this and they're that and we get this story in their mind that how bad they are to us and what they're doing against us. We shouldn't think the worst of somebody. We ought to, in 2020, give people the benefit of the doubt, right? Uh, that's what love does. Uh, love thinks no evil. Uh, love does right uh, toward other people. Go to 1 Corinthians 13 and look that up. That's so important. The word love is the bond of perfectness. That's your five words. Uh, but to close tonight, I want to give you three resolutions to make. How many of you have made a New Year's resolution? Okay, several of you. How do you do that? Do you all write them down somewhere? Raise your hand if you wrote down New Year's resolution. You wrote them down. Okay, so a couple. Okay. 
Uh, mainly just make them and kind of stick to them in your mind, in your heart. Resolve to do these things, right? These are three resolutions that I think every one of us should ascribe to. And the reason I say that, because if you're in church here today, you're telling me you want to follow Christ, these are Bible resolutions. So I got you on that one. Here we go. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. The Bible says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. It's resolution number one. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you are also called in one body, and be ye thankful. This whole passage is talking about our relationships with other people, about dealing with conflict, about forgiving and uh, overlooking others' faults. The Bible says that that peace of God, it uses the word rule. That word means to reign, means to make decisions. The idea is that whatever course of action best maintains the unity of the body of Christ and the harmony, that peace that, uh, among Christian brothers and sisters, that should be the, the, the way that we choose. The peace of God, the peace of God that bonds us together. The Bible says that we are one body. We're called to be one. Um, there's so many passages of, of Scripture that say how important the unity of the church is, the unity of the church. Listen, if, if we can think up all the goals and, and pray about all the things we want to do, we can put together a grand stage and scheme for 2020 uh, with the Easter drama. But if there's disunity among the members of the church, that it's not going to work. We have to work together. We have to have healthy relationships within the church. And the Bible says to let the peace of God rule. We need to be asking ourselves, will this bring peace? Will this decision I make bring peace? If I say that, will it bring peace? If I do this, will it bring peace? Let the peace of God rule in your heart and your decisions. Here's the second resolution to make. Verse number 16. The Bible says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Resolution number two. What is the Word of Christ? The Bible, right? The things that we read about that He says, and uh, we consider this to be the Word of God. The Bible calls itself the Word of God, God that's sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible says that we should let or allow the Word of God to dwell in us richly. That's a significant word used here, that word dwell. It means to be at home. Or to live. Um, I recently moved into a new home. And if you ever remember moving into a new home, the first night you sleep in that home, does it feel like home? It is so weird. Our, the floor creaks in weird spots. Our toilet turns on and runs at weird times. I noticed that. There's weird sounds. It just doesn't feel like home. I felt like I was sleeping in someone else's house or like a hotel or an Airbnb. And something like, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Uh, I wasn't at home. Uh, it's taken several days to feel at home in our house. Uh, we've been there now uh, for, what, about a week. And uh, it's feeling more and more like home each day. But the idea here... Letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom. The idea that God's Word ought to be at home in your heart. That it ought to live there. It ought to be, feel normal that it's there. It, it should dwell. It, it's home rest inside of you. The idea is that on a regular basis, it is there. It is getting there. You're reading you're learning, you're hearing God's Word on a regular basis. The Bible says that this Word of Christ is going to dwell in you richly so much that, and it continues the thought, that you're going to be teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That word, dwell in you richly, has the idea of overflowing. That the Word of God is going in you so much that it is overflowing out of you. So I wonder, what is your plan to allow the Scriptures to dwell in you richly this year? How are you doing it? Uh, sometimes the Word of God isn't dwelling in us. It's, 
it's moved out temporarily, right? It's in the garage or something like that, you know? It's like living in the garage. It's cold out there, and it, it wants back in, okay? Uh, we need to allow God's Word to dwell in us. The, the fact that we have a regular time where God's Word is going in so much that it's overflowing, that we would be able to teach others God's Word, that we would be admonishing. That has the idea that we're involved in one another's life to the point where, man, we're, we have this spiritual bond that we want to help one another actually follow what the Bible has to say. There, that's only going to happen if you're setting your affections on things above and if you are doing this, letting the Word of Christ, Christ dwell in you richly. And here is resolution Number three, the Bible continues in verse 17. This is a a great resolution to have. And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Third resolution is to do all in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, whatever you do, that's anything. That's if you're going to work, if you're, I was going to say mowing your grass, shoveling snow, okay, coming up here. No matter what you're doing, if you're talking to your neighbor, if you're talking to your family, if you're at a family function, if you're at church, if you're serving, whatever you're doing, the Bible says in word and in deed. It doesn't matter what you're saying or anything you're doing. Everything that you do in your life, if you're eating, whatever it is, every, every single behavior that you do, the Bible says that we should do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you do something in the name of someone else, what that means is you're doing it on behalf of them. You are doing it as a representative of them. We know that that is what we are. We are ambassadors for Christ. When we got saved, we were given a new job description, ambassador, that our role is to represent Christ wherever it is we go. And if we're going to make this resolution, it's us saying no matter where we're at, what would Jesus do in this situation? It's the, the old uh, WWJD bracelet, right? It's a great, great concept. But the idea is that it stems right from this passage. Whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. You, you have to think, and when it, especially when it comes to the topic that we're on today, this healthy relationships and loving others as Christ commanded us, What would Jesus say to that person that has offended you? What would Jesus say to that person in the relationship that you have that's strained? What would Jesus say to the new friend that you make? What would Jesus say to your neighbor? What would Jesus say to the office worker or the co-worker that you have that you're working on a project with? Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus.